My name is Jay Gorman. I'm an anesthesiologist and critical care fellow at the University of Alberta. This presentation is on the use of gastric ultrasound and its relationship to airway management and aspiration risk. I would like to thank the Alberta Sono team for their ongoing mentorship and help preparing this presentation. While point of care ultrasound continues to improve our diagnostic and procedural abilities, gastric ultrasound interestingly isn't a new idea. Interest in gastric ultrasound dates back at least to the late 1970s. Professor William McDicken, a Scottish medical physicist, and his colleagues published a manuscript in 1980 assessing the stomachs of both fasted and unfasted healthy volunteers by ultrasound. They reported that the antrum of the stomach was visu visualized most frequently using a longitudinal plane of scan in the lower epigastrum. Although due to limitations of the technology at the time, they were unable to reliably visualize the stomach in obese patients or when it was empty. They were also interested in manipulating motility and demonstrated the promotility effects of metoclopramide real-time sonographically. So who does this apply to? Who should be interested in point-of-care ultrasound of the stomach? Primarily clinicians who administer sedation or general anesthesia and manage airways as part of their practice including anesthesiologists, intensivists, and emergency medicine providers. While relatively uncommon, we know that pulmonary aspiration of gastric contents continues to be an important and serious complication of sedation and airway management. The risk of an aspiration event should be incorporated into sedation and airway management plans, and gastric ultrasound can help with this. To elaborate on the risks of aspiration events, According to a relatively recent publication in Anesthesia and Intensive Care by Dr. Kluger and his colleagues, of the first 4,000 incidents reported since the development of an online anesthesia adverse event reporting system, 121 involved aspiration events. Of these, around half were associated with significant harm and admission to a high dependency unit or ICU, and eight of these patients died. Interestingly, 57 or 47% of these were considered elective surgical procedures. Similarly, a closed claims analysis of aspiration events was published by Dr. Warner and colleagues in Anesthesiology in 2021. Based on data from 2000 to 2013, they found 115 claims related to aspiration of gastric contents, and two-thirds of these patients died or suffered a permanent severe injury as a consequence of the aspiration event. So while these events seem uncommon, the consequences can be severe. Unfortunately, it's not always easy to predict who's at risk and what we should do about it. Consensus guidelines provide us with fasting intervals for elective procedures for patients at low risk of aspiration. But what should we do when this isn't the case? A situation that we often find ourselves in. For example, what about the situation where we can't confirm adherence to fasting guidelines possibly due to dementia, a decreased level of consciousness, or a language barrier. Or for patients taking medications or with medical conditions that are associated with delayed gastric emptying, which is a long list, and urgent or emergency situations. We could just assume the patient has a full stomach and is at elevated risk of aspiration, but regardless of whether we, we adjust our sedation and airway management plan, assuming the patient has a full stomach, or we delay the procedure, this assumption and approach isn't without its own risks. Point of care gastric ultrasound may help us in these situations. Let's briefly touch on some relevant anatomy. This image is from an excellent gastric ultrasound resource by Dr. Perlas from the Ultrasound for Regional Anesthesia website. We can see that the stomach is a J-shaped organ with the fundus being the most cephalad and the body the largest component. We're most interested in the antrum, which lies between the gastric body and the pyloric sphincter, because the antrum can be used to estimate the total contents of the stomach. The antrum is best visualized in a parasagittal plane, which I'll talk more about. These images are from another great resource called gastricultrasound.org. In terms of helpful landmarks to orient us, we can see the liver screen left, or cephalad to the antrum, the superior mesenteric artery, and the aorta that can be seen in long axis deep to the antrum. The antrum, labeled A, when it's empty, may have a multi-layered appearance, although this isn't always seen and will depend to some degree on the resolution of the image. 
Okay, so getting started. The knobology will vary depending on the machine that you use, but we'll talk about the approach in general. In terms of transducer selection, for gastric ultrasound in adults, the curvilinear transducer will typically be most useful. In children or thin adults, a linear transducer can be tried and will provide higher resolution images. After selecting the curvilinear probe, then select the abdominal preset and you are ready to obtain an image. With the patient in the supine or semi-recumbent position to start, place the probe in the epigastric region and in the sagittal plane with the index marker pointing toward the patient's head, as shown here on the left. The abdominal preset typically includes a screen orientation according to the radiology convention, but you can confirm this by looking for a marker on the left side of the screen shown here with a red arrow, as well as by landmark structures in your image. The image can then be optimized with depth and gain as appropriate. With sliding movements plus or minus some subtle rotation, the antrum of the stomach can be identified in short axis at the level of the aorta, which we can see here as a hyperechoic oval structure at a depth of approximately six centimeters. Note that the antrum circled here is collapsed with no internal contents and if this appearance remains in the right lateral decubitus position, then we can confidently call this an empty stomach. We can also faintly see the aorta in long axis at a depth of around 14 centimeters, and this landmark along with the liver can be helpful in identifying the antrum. Here's an example of a full stomach. It has a frosted glass appearance because of a mix of air and gastric contents along the anterior wall of the antrum and this results in blurring of deeper structures. With less air in the antrum, we can clearly see the posterior wall and deeper structures. The solid contents have a heterogeneous, hyperechoic appearance. Occasionally when we are scanning over the left hemidiaphragm, as part of a lung exam for example, we will incidentally find an obviously full stomach, such as this one shown here. This is a similar example in a patient who had an upper GI bleed with the stomach shown here full of blood. This, of course, represents a significant aspiration risk if the patient develops a decreased level of consciousness or if sedation or airway manipulation is required. I was the sonographer and patient for this one, so you'll have to excuse the extra transducer movements. You can see my antrum has no internal contents to begin with. I started to drink a glass of water at about the 8 second mark, and then you can see my antrum fill with clear fluids mixed with air. When the antrum is filled with clear fluids with fewer air bubbles, it has this hypoechoic appearance. One of the challenges is that low-risk fasted patients not uncommonly have up to 1.5 milliliters per kilogram of gastric fluid. The specific volume that's considered safe from an aspiration risk standpoint is controversial, but this can be used as a reasonable upper limit. Based on studies comparing the antral area to direct measurement, we can estimate the total gastric volume in the setting of clear fluid content, and this can be used to differentiate these patients. To measure gastric content for an adult, place the patient in the right lateral decubitus position and obtain an image of the antrum at the level of the aorta. Freeze the image and trace the full thickness of the wall using the free tracing tool and the equation shown here can be used to estimate total volume. This calculation has been validated and can be used in both normal weight and obese patients. The most common approach to differentiating low aspiration risk from high risk is this antral grading system. Grade 0 and 1 are both considered low risk, and grade 2 is high risk. Grade 0 is defined as an empty antrum in both the supine and right lateral decubitus positions. Grade 1 is an empty antrum in the supine position and clear fluid with an estimated volume of less than 1.5 milliliters per kilogram in the right lateral decubitus position, which roughly corresponds to a cross-sectional area less than 10 centimeters squared for the average adult. Grade 2 is when there is clear fluid visible in both positions, with an estimated volume greater than 1.5 mL per kilogram. 
Two other populations who I'll talk briefly about are pregnancy and pediatric patients. This BJA education article from 2021 nicely outlines an approach to gastric ultrasound for the pregnant patient. From a technique standpoint, the patient can be positioned in a semi-recumbent and right lateral semi-recumbent position. The approach to image acquisition is similar, but it may be more challenging to obtain adequate views of the antrum and aorta due to the gravid uterus. The same approach to antral grading can be used with or without a modified model validated in pregnant patients, recognizing that there is a greater degree of uncertainty. One such example is from this study published in Anesthesia in 2018. Based on 60 non-laboring third trimester pregnant patients in the 45 degree semi-recumbent right lateral position who drank predetermined volumes of clear fluids, a cutoff value of 9.6 centimeters squared for antral cross-sectional area discriminated ingested volumes greater than or equal to 1.5 milliliters per kilogram. Similarly, for pediatric patients, a predictive model was developed comparing the antral cross-sectional area to endoscopically suctioned volumes, and the model shown here at the bottom of the slide was developed. There will always be cases that present uncertainty, patient populations who are underrepresented or excluded from current studies. A few examples of limitations to consider or situations with known altered anatomy include a previous gastric resection or bypass, gastric band, funduplication, or hiatal hernia. That's it for this presentation. Thank you very much for listening.